welcome to everybody who's already in the room. Uh, we'll give a few more minutes for folks to make their way into the webinar. I'll get us kicked off here as we're waiting for folks to continue making their way into the seminar. Uh, on behalf of the Biomaker Space and the Biomakers Group, I'd like to welcome everybody here today to our next installment on the COVID-19 Biomaking Solutions Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, we've had uh, a number of great talks so far. We're um, now on the on the back half of our lineup for the summer and uh, looking forward to hearing about some, some new tools and, and resources uh, toward fighting COVID. Um, up on the screen, you can see uh, the lineup of, of speakers. I would like to just mention and call, we've added one more at this point uh, on August 5th, uh, Dr. Gifford uh, will be speaking on that day. Uh, also on this slide, there's information about contact. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of me or uh, any other uh, uh, folks uh, with the Biomaker Space or the student group, contact information is there, as well as a link to the, uh, the webpage that we have for this seminar series where you can register for upcoming talks, and uh, view the videos that have been posted to date of previous talks. Um, you can also sign up on any one of our group uh, mailing lists that are listed uh, below. Uh, those are through the mailman system. If you have any trouble with that as well, uh, you can simply email us and we'll be glad to help you. Uh, all right, so the remaining talks will be uh, on Wednesdays at noons, as you can see. Uh, we'll have give standard reminder emails uh, before the uh, before those on the distribution list. Um, a few notes just about operations logistics for today. Please do hold all the questions until the end. Uh, when you have a question, please use the raise hand icon on the participants tab. It works much more smoothly if we can bring you the off mute and let you ask your questions directly. Um, if you do have any trouble with that, uh, you can send me a note and I'll be happy to try to assist you. Uh, we are recording the session today and we will be posting a video that's um, as, soon as, as soon as possible, as soon as it's available. Uh, so for today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Pranam Chatterjee. Dr. Chatterjee is MIT through and through. He received his bachelor's degree in computer science and, and molecular biology, that's course six, seven, uh, with a senior thesis entitled Synthetic Meganucleases for Genome Editing. Uh, his focus on CRISPR technology and genome editing uh, continued as pursued master's and then PhD at the MIT Media Lab with Professor Joe Jackson as part of the Molecular Machines Group. His thesis was titled Robust Genome Editing with Broad Targeting CRISPR Enzymes. Uh, I became first acquainted with Dr. Chatterjee's work and expertise with CRISPR during this past IAP when I heard uh, fantastic things about his IAP course, which was CRISPR Hacking the Genome. 
Uh, and I really can't think of much higher accolades than the rave reviews of, of our MIT students. So in addition to CRISPR technology, Dr. Chatterjee also has a substantial background in immunology, having research experience with the Irvine Lab at the Koch Institute here at MIT, as well as Harvard Medical School and Pfizer. Uh, the confluence of these backgrounds has come together in the research that you may have seen reported through the MIT News on June 22nd, and we are very fortunate to have Dr. Chatterjee with us here today to tell us more about his work on computation-mediated protein engineering of robust genome editing and antiviral treatments against SARS-CoV-2. So welcome, Pranam. Thank you so much, Justin. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for having me and uh, coming to the seminar to listen about my work. I'm always really excited to hear about the uh, you know, the, the feedback I have for my work and looking forward to hearing your comments. Um, so I'm going to share my screen if that's cool. Um, awesome. I will share it and then, great, let's go. Awesome. So again, as Justin mentioned, I'm here to talk about some of the exciting protein engineering work we have done in here in the lab, both for developing better CRISPR tools, as well as applying those same techniques to build uh, antiviral tools for specifically for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I am just, I just finished my PhD here at the Media Lab, um, and I'm about to transition to Harvard Medical School as a research fellow there. Um, but before I begin, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have a kind of a weird background. Um, I actually began as a religion major at Dartmouth College where I studied East Asian religions like uh, Shintoism, Buddhism, Taoism. But as Justin mentioned, I was really excited about biology and immunology in, in particular. And I worked very a lot on what the PD-1 molecule from at Harvard, at Pfizer, at MIT. And as you, you may know about PD-1, it's a, a very for a drug right now on the market for, um, for cancer, Keytruda, Opdivo, uh, these are blocking PD-1 antibodies. Um, and so we were, I was able, fortunate to be able to publish a lot of basic biology work on PD-1, understanding how it worked. Um, and then I came and transferred from Dartmouth to uh, MIT to finish out my undergraduate career, where I focused a lot on computer science with applications to molecular biology and all of that and especially uh, with focus on machine learning. All of that brought me here to the Media Lab. And so you guys may be thinking, you know, the Media Lab, why, why are you there? Because when you think about the Media Lab, you think of, you know, something like this, right? Very futuristic technologies like robotics or big data or, you know, uh, social media data analytics, something like that, right? Well, the reason I'm here at the Media Lab is because of my professor, Professor Joe Jacobson, who is the inventor of the Kindle. Um, the e-ink display. That's why we're here at the Media Lab. But as you can see, he's standing in front of a bench, uh, a bio, bio bench, uh, which is where we've set up a space completely where it used to be nanofabrication tools, where the e-ink was actually invented to now a really, uh, you know, kind of cool bio space, almost like a biomaker space in itself. Um, and so at the lab, you know, what we have done is focused on two main technologies. One, uh, being computation and AI, um, clearly that is uh, you know a, a field that has taken over um, our world, as well as genome editing, which has been the primary focus of my work here um, at MIT. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about genome editing. I don't know how much you all know, but I'll go into the basics very quickly, so you won't be too lost during my talk. At, the, at its core, genome editing is not a very complicated concept. It's simply the ability to make precise changes at the DNA level to genomes. Why DNA? Because according to the central dogma of biology, which you all know, DNA can be transcribed into an intermediate RNA molecule, which can get, then get translated into proteins. And proteins are the building blocks of you know, your cells, your tissues, your organs and the building blocks of all of life. So if you can change the code for those proteins, you can change the composition of life. And so that's why genome editing is so powerful because you can change that DNA code, but why would you want to do that, right? Well, there's some good reasons. Um, one, you would like to be able to fix mutations in genes that cause diseases such as cystic fibrosis. You know, genome editing has also been used to engineer crops like rice to carry more nutrient content. Genome editing has also been used to engineer microorganisms such as algae and yeast to be able to generate new and more efficient biofuels and bioethanol. 
Genome editing has also been used to shape our ecosystem. Kevin Esfeld, a professor here at the Media Lab, has pioneered the concept of gene drives, which is uh, the use of genome editing to introduce traits into organisms and have those traits be passed down until every organism in that population has it. For example, something like malaria resistance through a mosquito population. But best of all, genome editing has already accelerated the science and research we do today. You know, just a few years ago, it would take, you know, a year or so to just generate a mouse model to study a specific disease. But now with CRISPR and genome editing, it's, this process is much more streamlined and much faster. And these are just a few of the reasons why genome editing is already such a powerful tool in our arsenal to do biology. But, you know, we're all scientists, you guys are biomakers. And so what's really important is how you can do genome editing, right? At its core, genome editing is, again, not too, too complicated. If you have a DNA sequence that you want to edit, the first thing you want to do is be able to target it, right? You want to go to that DNA sequence that you want to change. And once you go there, you want to be able to make a modification at its simplest form that's being able to cut, make a double-stranded break at that DNA sequence. Why? Because when the cell sees a double-stranded break, it tries to fix that break using a process called non-homologous end joining, NHEJ. I'm not going to describe what that is, but it's simply NHEJ for the most part, 70% of the time make, takes those two ends and just re-ligates them back together, a perfect fix. The other 30% of the time, there are, this process is very messy, very error prone. We get you know, insertions and deletions, and this causes mutations that essentially disrupt that gene, turn it off, essentially prevent it from translating into the correct protein. Similarly, you could actually uh, be nice to the cell and provide this donor DNA template that the cell can use to fix that cut site. You have homologous arms to the cut site, and this allows the cell to use a process called homology directed repair, HDR, so that it can use that donor DNA template and insert the DNA sequence that you design within it. And that's a process that we call gene insertion. And so this is a very powerful way to introduce new DNA sequences into genomes. So this is genome editing. It's not much more complicated than this. Um, and CRISPR is a tool that you guys have probably all heard of. It's a very streamlined tool to do this targeting and cutting. But it's not something that you know, we invented as genome engineers. It's actually something that nature gave us. It's a bacterial immune system. As you can see, CRISPR is something bacteria use to remember uh, viruses that infected, bacteriophages that infect them, such that every time a bacteria, a virus infects a bacteria, the bacteria will take a piece of the viral DNA and store it within themselves in a CRISPR array, such that the next time the virus comes and infects that bacteria, the bacteria will be like, hey, I remember you. I'm going to take this piece of viral DNA that I stored from you, and I'm going to translate, transcribe it into RNA and, and using CRISPR enzyme to go and chop up the, the viral DNA so that it can no longer infect. That's CRISPR at its core. And we as genome engineers want to apply that system to edit the genomes of plants, of animals, of humans. And so we have this really simple CRISPR-Cas9 system to do genome editing. Basically, CRISPR-Cas9 consists of two parts, a guide RNA that targets a specific sequence and a Cas9 enzyme that can actually cut that sequence. And so, and when, remember when you can target and cut, you can do genome editing. But CRISPR is a natural system and it comes with its own limitations for actual genome editing purposes. I mean, for one, there's a lot of what we call off-target effects of CRISPR, where sometimes you wanna target a specific gene, but the CRISPR system will accidentally go to another gene where it's not supposed to target and make edits there. And that's a problem that we need to fix before this can be translated into a very useful tool for something like therapeutics. A second problem of CRISPR, and something I'll talk about very briefly today, is the uh, fact that CRISPR can't actually go to every DNA sequence in the body. That's because each CRISPR enzyme, the Cas9, requires a short sequence called the PAM, the protospacer adjacent motif, beside the target sequence in the genome. So if you want to target that sequence, that sequence better have a short PAM beside it. 
here are a commonly used CRISPR enzyme list that, uh, you know, this is the ones that, these are the enzymes that people use to do genome editing. And as you can see, each of those enzymes comes from a specific bacteria and has a specific PAM sequence that it needs to target and cut. The most commonly used enzyme is this one from Streptococcus pyogenes bacteria called SPCAS9. Its PAM is NGG. So it needs two Gs, N being any base. And if you do the math, right, how many times does NGG appear in the genome, right? There's two, remember DNA is four bases, so you have one over four to the second because there's two Gs, times two because you can target either strand. So at your limit, you can target up to 12.5% of the genome, which is, you know, not that much, I guess. What about the other 87.5% of the genome that you can't target because you need to use this enzyme? Well, this is something that me and Noah, a former grad student in the lab, uh, tried to solve using computation. Essentially, we've tried to look through all the different CRISPR enzymes in nature um, and find parts of CRISPR enzymes that we thought would help that enzyme to be more flexible, to have a different PAM sequence. We quickly honed in on this one enzyme from Streptococcus canis bacteria, SCCAS9. But as you, if you take a first look at the protein sequence of SCCAS9 aligned to the protein sequence of SPCAS9, the original one, you can see that it's pretty similar. Every time you see black uh, highlighting, that means that the enzymes are exactly the same. In fact, the enzymes are about 90% similar to each other. And so you'd be maybe saying, hey, Pranam, that means that these enzymes are probably the same or most likely the same and have the same PAM, right? Well, if you look more closely, there are two amino acids that we know from structural studies that, that contact the two uh, Gs for SPCAS9. These are the two arginines you see here, this R and R, that contact the two Gs and allow it, that force it to bind to those Gs before it can do genome editing. But in SCCAS9, if you look right beside those two arginines, it has this additional insertion, new two amino acids that SPCAS9 does in this KQ insertion. And if you look even farther up in the protein sequence of SCCAS9, you can see that there's this another, another insertion in SCCAS9, these new amino acids that don't exist in SPCAS9. And if you look even closer, you see a lot of K's, H's, and R's, these are positively charged amino acids, basically saying that now here's additional positive charge that could help, you know, a gene editing enzyme bind to negatively charged DNA. So we were really intrigued by this enzyme. And so when we tried, we, before we actually tested it, we decided to model this enzyme. We tried to model what that insertion, that, you know, that positively charged insertion did. If you look closely, that insertion forms what we call a loop. It comes down and interacts with, you guessed it, these two green bases, those are your two Gs, uh, the, the PAM of SPCAS9 when we modeled it within there. So that begged the question, what is the PAM of SCCAS9 now that it has these two interesting components? Well, we used a, a genetic circuit in the lab, um, basically something called PAM scanner, where if you have a Cas9 that you wanted to test, you would pretty much allow, if it could bind a specific PAM in a library of you know, every PAM sequence possible, you would turn off a gene called LAC-I and you turn on green fluorescent protein. So basically, every time your Cas9 binds a specific PAM sequence, that cell turns green. And you can sort those green cells by flow cytometry. And then you can sequence the PAMs that it bound to and you could get a signal for what that PAM sequence is. When we first tested SPCAS9, as you can see, yes, it does bind to NGG. The two yellow humps are two Gs, so we know that, that our, our assay worked. SCCAS9, on the other hand, actually only needed one G. It did not need two Gs. It did not need any other bases, and so that was really cool because now no longer did we need two Gs to bind. You only need one, and what was even more interesting was when you took out from the protein, we actually went into the protein, took out the loop and the KQ, the PAM of SCCAS9 went back to NGG, telling us that those two insertions were sufficient for SCCAS9 to obtain the flexibility needed to only need one G. And so we showed that this was also true in human cells, and we were able to publish that work um, 
few years ago, it was actually kind of exciting. A lot of people thought that, hey, this is great because now we can target a lot more of the genome. You know, there was a lot of kind of news articles on this work. You know, SCCAS9 actually has already been used around the world. I mean, for example, here are two papers where SCCAS9 has been used to uh, edit the genomes of rice, for example. So people have started to use our enzyme um, for genome editing in other organisms. But SCCAS9 was only one of the three single G Cas9s that was uh, discovered in nature um, or were actually engineered that year in 2018. You know, David Liu's group at the Broad used uh, evolution to make an, an enzyme called XCAS9 that could also bind to a single G. Feng Zhang's group at the Broad also utilized a structure guided mutagenesis. They looked at this crystal structure of the protein and mutated the enzyme so that it would not need that uh, second G in the NGG PAM. And as I showed you previously, as CCAS9, actually uh, we used bioinformatics to be able to discover a cousin of SPCAS9 that also only needed a single G. And when you do the math, right, now you only need one G, so it's one over four to the one times two. So now the amount of uh, DNA sequences you can target with these two enzymes is 50%, which is really great. It's a huge expansion in the number of DNA sequences that you can target. But all of these enzymes have their own properties. I'm gonna kind of hit on SCCAS9 for quickly. You see, SCCAS9 has very few off-target effects, which is great because it doesn't accidentally go edit the wrong gene most of the time. But it's on-target effects, where, where it's supposed to actually edit, its efficiency is kind of low. So even though it's broad, its efficiency is you know, low, and so it doesn't have great genome editing activity. So that begs the question, right? What makes an optimal Cas9? Well, I'll say at least three uh, characteristics have to be met to have a good Cas9. One, you want your CRISPR enzyme to be broad. You want to be able to go to a lot of DNA sequences to be able to edit them, right? But when you're at those sequences, you want to make sure that you edit well. You have high gene editing activity so that you don't edit some cells and not edit others. That's a process we call mosaicism that we don't want to occur. Finally, when you edit well, you also want to make sure you don't edit at the wrong sites, right? You want to make sure that your enzyme is specific to your on-target site and there are few off-target effects. And so if we look at the enzymes that I just mentioned, you know, XCAS9 is not very broad, but it is quite specific. So it doesn't actually have a single GPAM. It has, uh, but it is very, uh, has low off-target effects. SPCAS9NG it's quite efficient and broad, but it's not very specific. It has a lot of off-target effects that you would not want to use this enzyme. And as I showed you previously, SCCAS9, our enzyme is quite broad and specific, but its efficiency is kind of low. So as you can see, all three of these enzymes are missing one of the key properties of genome editing. And so what you want is an enzyme that has all three of these optimal properties, right? And so that's what we tried to do. Basically, we took SCCAS9 and using bioinformatics, we decided to say, hey, let's look for other enzymes in nature that had parts that we could use to engineer SCCAS9 with. You know, we quickly identified two parts, one from Streptococcus gordoni Cas9 and another uh, part, another loop structure from Streptococcus anginosis Cas9. We called these the two plus changes. And together we engineered an enzyme called into SCCAS9 called SC++ with those two, in, two insertions, kind of a, a, an homage to our computational background. So SC++ is now an engineered version of SCCAS9. And when we tested SC++, we first, using PAM scanner, remember that genetic circuit, we saw that SC++ actually bound and turned more cells green than the other enzymes. And you turn more cells green, meaning you can bind more PAMs, meaning you're broader in terms of the number of sequences that you can target. For efficiency, we saw that SC++ was actually a, a quite a bit more efficient than the other enzymes we tested. I think on average, it was about 2.28 times more efficient than SPCAS9NG, the previously most efficient enzyme. Finally, we collaborated with uh, Eric Sondheimer's lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and we showed that SC++ actually has 
quite a few off target, like very, very few off target effects compared to the original enzyme. And when you engineer SC++ further, you can actually get an enzyme called Hi-Fi SC++ that has almost negligible off target effects. So like no off target effects at all. And we can even show that Hi-Fi SC++ is on to off ratio, meaning the number of times it edits on target versus the number of times it edits off target is a whopping like six, which is about 600 times better than SPCAS9NG, for example. So this enzyme is something that I think we can fill, fill this chart with, uh, Hi-Fi SC++. It's broad, it's efficient, and it's specific. You know, we published that work really recently in Nature Biotech. Um, and so if you want to take a look and read about our enzymes, feel free to do so. You know, but that still asks us, hey, these are enzymes that still need a single G, right? So what about the other 50% of DNA sequences that you can't target if you only need a single G? Well, because if you think about it, uh, the most common dinucleotide in the human genome is not NGG, which is the PAM of SPCAS9. The most common dinucleotide is actually NAA. So if you could start with an enzyme that PAM, whose PAM was NAA and not NGG, you could target a much larger portion of the human genome and you could even engineer that further. And so that's what we tried to do, but we didn't have any way to actually find an enzyme that needed A's and not G's. And so we designed an algorithm called the search for PAMs by alignment of targets, uh, for shorthand for Spamalot, um, where Spamalot is an algorithm that could actually predict the PAM sequence of enzymes that have never been tested before. But first, we could even validate that Spamalot worked on enzymes that actually had been validated. So like you can see Spamalot predicts that the PAM of SPCAS9 is NGG, and so we know that our algorithm works, but we can also predict Cas9s that we don't know the PAM experimentally. So this helps us to identify Cas9s much quicker. Spamalot identified a really cool enzyme for us. It's called Streptococcus macaque Cas9 that only needed two A's from our, bio, from our bioinformatics prediction. When we tested SMAC Cas9, Streptococcus macaque Cas9, we saw that yes, SMAC Cas9 could cut at every NAA PAM, not needing Gs at all for cutting. But as you can see, the, N the efficiency of SMAC Cas9 is very low. This is a fraction cleaved. The two bands are kind of weak. So how do you make this better? Well, we because Streptococcus macaque is so similar to Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9, the original SP Cas9, we essentially took the PAM interacting domain, the part of the enzyme that interacts with the PAM of MAC, and then fused it to the other part of SPYCAS9, of SPCAS9. And that new enzyme we called SPYMAC for those two parts. SPYMAC was a lot more efficient. It cut on NAA PAMs and it was cutting really uh, well, meaning that the efficiency is quite high for SPYMAC Cas9. And when we tested this in human cells, we saw that SPYMAC actually edited pretty well on the NAA targets, while SPCAS9 could only edit on NGG, but we actually engineered SPYMAC more further using adding mutations from previous work done to in, improve SPCAS9. And we called our new Cas9 iSPYMAC, improved SPYMAC Cas9. And iSPYMAC had far much more improved editing efficiency, even editing at sites that SPYMAC could not edit at. And so we were able to publish that work also pretty recently, like last month. And SPYMAC has actually been used too. Um, there's this group in China that used SPYMAC to engineer rabbit embryos and actually convert the fur color of a rabbit from black to white. Um, and so this has been already used in other organisms to engineer uh, different phenotypic traits. So this is kind of cool. SPYMAC is already being used in around the world. And so to kind of conclude the CRISPR part of this talk, um, you know, we have pretty much taken uh, you know, SP Cas9, the original Cas9. And for, for example, a gene like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy that you would like to target to edit and fix that disease, here are the number of targets you can go after with SP Cas9. Now, with SC and iSpyMac, you can target a lot more of this gene sequence. So that's kind of cool. 
And so we're using that to apply for d uh, diseases like Huntington's disease, you know, we're engineering uh, uh, bases within the Huntington repeat, which causes the disease. You know, we're even using our enzymes for uh, uh, other um, diseases like Rett syndrome, which is an X-linked disease to fix mutations. As you can see, SC++ is able to target uh, seven of the eight mutations uh, that cause Rett syndrome, which is really exciting. And so if you want to read more about our work, this is, uh, this is kind of a recent article on all of the CRISPR work that we have done in the lab um, and has been used uh, around the world for a more expansive genome editing. But I know the point, point of this talk, and I know I've gone a little long, um, is to talk about uh, how we've utilized these similar computational methods to identify and engineer uh, potential therapeutics for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19. Because if you think about it, COVID-19 is, you know, we're in bad, we're in huge need of both vaccines and therapeutics. I mean, there are a lot of vaccine trials begun as well as a lot of therapeutic trials begun, but nothing is actually, you know, nothing's actually here yet. And so it's always important to engineer and identify better vaccines and therapeutics for this uh, disease and for this pandemic. All of these vaccines and therapeutics kind of focus on the mechanism by which SARS-CoV-2 infects the cell right? Because SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus that binds to the ACE2 receptor on human cells, most preferentially lung epithelial cells. And when it makes that binding interaction, it undergoes other conformational changes that allows it to enter the cell and infect. And so that's something that we were really interested in exploiting to develop a therapeutic. You know, previously there was a paper that showed that you can take ACE2 right, a por portion of ACE2 that is not the membrane uh, portion of ACE2 called soluble ACE2, which can exist by itself, and you can have that actually competitively intercept the virus. Basically, it'll bind the virus, not allowing the virus to enter the cell via ACE2. And so this is kind of cool. This is a technique that was published in Cell just a few months, like a month ago, um, by using soluble ACE2 to, in to intercept and inhibit infection of the virus. But SACE2 is not an optimal therapeutic because it's too large and difficult to deliver. It's, it's quite big as a protein. It still has its own enzymatic function. You know, ACE2's main purpose is not to let coronavirus in. It has other functions that regulate something such as the angiotensin pathway. Furthermore, it binds off-target molecules like integrins that also have a very important functional role in the body. So you don't want to use the original ACE2 as a therapeutic because it has its own faults. And so what Minvita and I, Manu, who works in the biomaker space from time to time, you know, Manu and I, you know, Manu is a very a wonderful computer scientist. And so, and I work with her to develop a uh, new uh, protein sequences that can be useful for therapeutics. And so what we did was identified a computational pipeline that would enable us to take ACE2 and engineer it further to have optimal properties, to not be so big, to ha not have off-target effects, and to have other abilities to make sure that an, a patient would not uh, be infected with the virus. So we came up with a list of these uh, protein sequences as a result of our computational pipeline. And at, at its core, what we engineered are peptides, these short protein sequences that can bind to the coronavirus, to SARS-CoV-2, prevent it from infecting, also not bind integrins, which are off-target molecules, and have peptides, these same peptides can bind to mutated forms of SARS-CoV-2, such that if the virus mutates, our therapeutic will still be able to bind and prevent infection. But the question still arises, what if the virus still infects, right? Are we kind of stuck at that point? Because what if our therapeutic does not um, actually block the virus from infecting. You could use something like CRISPR, like something that I just talked about previously, because remember CRISPR can go in and chop up nucleic acids like DNA. There are CRISPR enzymes that can chop up RNA, which is what the virus uses to infect. And so if, the, if CRISPR can chop up the viral mRNAs, then you could pre essentially prevent reinfection. But remember, this has already been done. Um, Stanley Cheese Group at Stanford has used CRISPR as an antiviral strategy to combat SARS-CoV-2. And so we were like, let's use our peptide approach to do something very similar. Because remember, our peptide binds the virus, right? 
So if you can attach something to the peptide, say something like an E3 ubiquitin ligase, pretty much what that can do is target that virus to be tagged for degradation in the proteasome, similar to what CRISPR is trying to do. So what we thought was like, hey, let's take our peptide, fuse it to an E3 ubiquitin ligase, and then allow it to be degraded. And so we thought we can use something like a TRIM21 molecule, which is a, an E3 ubiquitin ligase that could attach to an FC receptor that you attach to the peptide. This is something that TRIM21 does. It recognizes FC receptors. But we also thought that, hey, you know, you could use a more uh, a streamlined process where you could just attach the peptide to an E3 ubiquitin ligase, a chip delta TPR, which can then tag the virus and degrade it in the proteasome. When we first tested this, we saw that this system did not actually work very well. In fact, it, uh, I mean, we found one peptide, a 23-mer, a very short peptide that was able to degrade the virus, but only at about half the efficiency of the original ACE2. Then Manu in the lab took our original peptide and actually engineered it by finding mutations in the peptide that would make it a stronger binder to the virus. And when we did that experiment, we saw that our A2N, one mutant peptide, actually degraded the virus at a much higher efficiency. Over 50% of the viral component got degraded in our assay. You know, we've, this work is up on the bioarchive. Feel free to read about it in MIT News. Um, we're actually in the process of publishing this work. And the reason why this therapeutic is so powerful is that, again, it's really small. Together with the E3 ubiquitin ligase, it's less than 200 amino acids long, while CRISPR-Cas13 that was previously uh, suggested is over 1,000 amino acids long, which allows this our system to be easily packaged into an AAV or a different delivery vehicle and can be synthesized and inhaled as a peptide. It's also made up of completely human parts. So it's unlike CRISPR, which is a bacterial system, our peptide strategy reduces the potential immunogenic risks of introducing a new therapeutic because it's completely made of human proteins like ACE2 and, and E3 ubiquitin ligase. Finally, our protein acts as a Swiss army knife because you can remember I showed you that our protein can still block entry of the virus, even with or without the addition of this E3 ubiquitin ligase. But if the virus infects, that virus will, um, will immediately be tagged with this, uh, with this chip delta TPR for degradation in the proteasome, which is really exciting because now you can immediately degrade the virus if it infects itself. You know, we tested this in viral assays with George Church's lab at Harvard, where we showed that if you, when you make the pseudovirus, a pseudovirus, that virus can infect the cell and turn the cell green. But if you add our system into the viral assay, what we see is we, what we expect is that pseudovirus can no longer infect the cell. And so, as you can see, this is without the uh, without our chip uh, delta TPR uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase. And when you add that system in, you can reduce infection by about 50%, which allows us to now uh, prevent further reinfection from occurring by that amount. You know, we're actually about to go and put this whole system into non-human primates. Uh, we're working with a group in China to do so. Um, and so this could be a therapeutic that could be pretty viable um, for humans in the next, uh, you know, hopefully half year to a year. And so we're really excited uh, to have this therapeutic be used for clinical purposes. So that's it. Um, I know I talked a lot um, and I'm excited to hear your questions. Before I go, I want to thank the group of people that helped make all this work happen. You know, Noah, my professor, Joe Jacobson, as well as uh, our collaborators at UMass and Zurich and Harvard and Manu and the Media Lab who made the COVID work possible, as well as my two undergrads, uh, Sabrina and Emma, who's helped me do a lot of the experimental work. And also thank you to you guys, uh, the BioMaker space for allowing me to give this talk. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Excellent, thank you. Um, so folks, you have questions. Uh, as mentioned in the participants tab on the viewer, you can use the raise hand icon and I will unmute you to be able to ask, uh, ask questions. Uh, as we're waiting for folks to come up with questions, there aren't any up yet. Uh, I did have um, a, general, a general question from uh, somebody who was not able to attend today. Yeah. And they were just um, actually asking about uh, other 
other resources to, uh, to learn more about the key parameters for editing genetic material and some instruction or, or freeware. Are there other um, sites and references toward tools that you would like to point uh, interested people to? Yeah, I, I think like the best way, like I'm, I teach a CRISPR class, right? So like, this is something that people ask me a lot. How can I get my hands on these tools? I would very much suggest um, Ad Genes uh, CRISPR, uh, 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 I guess, what's it, uh, instruction booklet. I mean, it's really a great summary of every CRISPR tool there is at your fingertips. It's constantly updated and it's really easy to read for people who are not uh, you know, experts in the field. Um, and, and, and you can even go to AdGene and order things if you're working in a lab to simply be able to use you know, my CRISPR tools or other people's CRISPR tools. Um, I'll, send, I'll be able to send you the link, but I'm pretty sure you could just search AdGene CRISPR and be able to come at that, uh, at that site. Excellent. Um, all right. Um, I have a question here in the chat from uh, Arnab mm -hmm. uh, asking what your next step is uh, for, I think this is for you individually. It says that uh, it seems you've already graduated. Uh, where are you heading next? Yeah, it's a great question. I was actually going to do it if I had a little, I, I didn't want to waste too much time on that. So I'm going to actually go to George Church's lab at Harvard um, for my postdoc. Um, so I'm um, so when I go there, my the project I'm going to be working on is actually being able to differentiate an oocyte from a stem cell. So like I'm leading the oogenesis project of George's lab. It's very George Church. If you know George Church, it's a very George Church-like project. Um, and I'll be leading that project going there and being utilizing both a combination of computational uh, you know, data analysis as well as uh, experimental screens to identify factors that are responsible for turning a normal stem cell into an oocyte. Yeah, kind of a crazy project. Very cool. Um, well, say hi to uh, Oliver Dodd over there. He was one of the the uh, founders uh, who got the biomaker space up and running in we'll the do. early days. So we'll do. I don't I'll, think I'll he's uh, he's joining today, but uh, make sure you say hi. Yeah, we'll do definitely. So um, I'm I'm not terribly uh, proficient in CRISPR, so I've got a question that may be uh, relatively simple and trivial. But um, how much you know power do you have to improve selectivity? With the with the guide sequence and how much variability can you have within the length of that? Is that is that something where you can really enhance the? Yeah, the, so, the, like, so so off targets is definitely a problem. Um, and what you know, this is actually a really great question because I was going to present this work. Um, where where you know, there's many ways to reduce off target effects. Um, you are really limited to a 20 base pair guide RNA sequence. You can't go anything longer. There's no activity for your CRISPR enzyme. I think this is just what uh, nature evolved uh, for the original CRISPR system. So there have been many tricks to improve the specificity of CRISPR to reduce off target effects. One, you could obviously engineer the protein to have to be destabilized at off target sites re while remaining stable at on target sites that that has been done, you know, way and we did that too with our enzymes. Another strategy is actually, like you said, to go into the guide RNA sequence. Um, what we did, we took a very creative approach. This is something I did in my first year of grad school where, you know, guide RNA is just RNA, right? And RNA DNA uh, hybridization is quite stable such that even if you're wrong, right? Even if there's like one or two bases that are not perfectly matched, you still may be able to bind to that off target sequence, right? And be able to cut, which is bad. But we said that, hey, let's replace some of those RNA molecules with DNA, such that DNA-DNA hybrids are much less stable. And so if you did happen to be at the wrong DNA, wrong DNA sequence, this guide RNA-DNA, this hybrid guide, would be less stable at those sequences, but it would remain stable when there's perfect matches. We actually published that work in my first year of grad school. And this is a different way of reducing off-target effects by engineering the guide molecule rather than by engineering the protein. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, we got a couple more questions up in the chat. And uh, just as a reminder to any folks uh, would like to ask these out loud, certainly we'll, we'll bring you off mute to be able to do that. Um, but uh, I don't know if you've got the chat open here, but uh, I can read them. Uh, what is the first step to enter computational biology from pure biology and any recommended courses? Yeah, it's a great question. I think like, so I came from a computer science. I mean, 
I had a very weird strategy, but I do think um, it is a good skill to have a real experimental skills because I think computational biology by itself is probably not terribly useful. Like you can do great computational biology, but if there's no one to actually do the experiments for you, you know, you're kind of stuck. And so I definitely suggest like um, when you, once you have attained good experimental skills to be able to like learn very basic scripting ability, like uh, just say, how do you first uh, improve the workflows you do in the lab using computation? Maybe it's designing, you know, constructs or plasmids. That's a great first step. A second step would be then to learn what are the more core theoretical components of computer science that you could use to design new biological systems. So I would say take a, like a slower approach, like go start with, you know, the things that, uh, that you are familiar with in the lab, make those computational in, a, in whatever way you want, and then learn, you know, what extra computation can I do to make my discovery and experimental processes more efficient. Um, I, I definitely suggest co courses are great, but more so uh, practical usefulness of your computation is more important. There are great uh, courses. David Gifford, who's going to give a talk next week, is like one of the best, teaches a great machine learning course for computational biology, as well as, uh, you know, Manolis Kellis's class that can teach you all the core concepts of computational biology. Those are the two main classes at MIT that you can take. Great. Uh, next question up on the chat is, uh, do you compromise specificity when you broaden the genome coverage of Cas9 systems? That's the expected thing, right? That's what you would completely expect. You go to more DNA sequences, so there should be more off-target sequences that you could go to. But clearly, we saw first with, um, we saw first with uh, what do you call um, X-Cas9 that this enzyme was actually more specific than it was broad. And with our SC++, you saw that our enzyme was still quite broad. It was actually broader. It's like one of the broadest enzymes in the world right now, but it has very low off-target effects. And so we're trying to understand that from a structural perspective. Why do these two things happen? And I think what I will tell you is that specificity is usually pretty independent of the PAM. Um, the PAM is what it needs to bind, but its, uh, it's, it's specificity is more dependent on the guide RNA sequence, as Justin mentioned previously. Yeah. All right, we've got a couple more uh, questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I see the first question, um, whether peptide engineering or nanobody engineering, what do you prefer? I think peptides is a really cool strategy. Um, the reason we did peptides versus nanobodies were because, and for those of you who don't understand, nanobodies are like small antibodies, essentially. They're like really like short, like 120 amino acid antibodies. Peptides are really cool here because you can use, start with a human protein, right? You can start with a protein that is already existent and make it smaller to have the, the uh, properties you want. Nanobodies are usually synthetic, completely synthetic proteins. Um, and so they have other effects like potential immunogenic effects. They have toxic effects that you have to worry about. So we prefer peptides. However, nanobodies usually bind much stronger than peptides. And so we have to play that trade-off game. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you're right for the safety issues for our therapy. Um, that's one of the safety issues because when you use peptides, you can reduce immunogenic effects. However, because we have E3 ligase as an attachment, if your peptide binds to off-target sequences, you know, it'll tag those things for degradation. And if you start degrading random proteins in your body, you know, that's something that you want to avoid. And so we're going to actually do toxicity studies as well as um, uh, toxicity studies, as well as uh, um, you know, off-target effect studies in non-human primates. Um, that's our hope that we'll be able to do those, so that we can know what we need to worry about going into clinical trials. Awesome. I see an, a question from Elijah uh, as well. He said, "Can you give a basic overview of how the spamlot pipeline?" I could go back on the slides, but basically, if you remember, right, the uh, bacteria remember store pieces of viral DNA. That, the, that they were used to remember what viruses infected it. So what you could do for Spamalot is you could take those pieces of viral DNA in the bacteria. We look at the bacterial genome. We take those pieces of viral DNA and then we do a, a large scale mapping to viral sequences, every virus known. And then we would be like, okay, what are the short sequences beside those viral sequences? And that's your PAM, right? Because remember the PAM is the sequence beside your target sequence. And so CRISPR uses the PAM to prevent 
to prevent cutting of its own genome. So we were like, let's look at the short sequence beside the target sequence in viruses. And that's how we were able to predict the PAMs at scale. You can do this, you can write this pipeline and you can do this all automatically. And no, you don't have to manually do this pipeline. Great. I, I think these two, Sudarshan and Vipender, have been asking all the have been asking great questions. Um, uh, yeah, if you are interested in you know joining something like the Molecular Machines team, uh, you should come send me an email uh, at uh, pranam at mit.edu, and you know I, I would be fair, happy to forward that to Joe. Um, so the question on how to deliver the system, this peptide E3 ubiquitin ligase system, an AAV makes the most sense. Right, because you can you can actually encode it within the virus and have the have the safe virus in, infect the cell. That would be great, right? Because then you could have the have the system enter the cell. A second strategy would be to actually let the peptide E3 ubiquitin ligase try to block the virus from entering because it has the peptide component. If it enters, the virus can bring it with, along with it with it inside the cell and then be tagged for degradation. So you could actually just deliver it as an extracellular. A therapeutic, which can then be utilized for tagging and degradation once the virus enters. So these are the two strategies that we're envisioning to deliver our peptide uh, strategy. Yeah. Awesome. I feel like I'm having a chat. <laughs> this is great. Also, feel free to like. I guess Justin said, uh, ask questions by in person too. <laughs> If there's any more questions, I'm happy to answer. I, I know, Justin, you were saying that there, like, I looked at the list. You have some really impressive list of uh, people who come and talk here, like a lot of like professors and uh, really famous professors at MIT who come and give the talks. And it's really exciting to see how much COVID work is being done at MIT. Um, you know, our strategy was kind of our like pro you know, our protein mediated, you know, computational strategy that we've been doing in the past. And so I, I'm really excited. I may join in on like future calls just to see what the other work is, what other work is happening. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting to see the breadth of the approaches being taken. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great opportunity to employ a lot of different techniques and a lot of different skills to go after the same problem. And I think that's uh, obviously what we need in this type of situation. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah, I think uh, Sudarshan asked uh, like a third question, um, or like fourth maybe at this point, what are the major problems in present protein engineering? Um, I guess that's a great question because protein engineering is something you can do from many different angles. Obviously, you can use something like directed evolution, which is what like a lot of groups at the Broad do. Um, that's one strategy. You, I mean, that's something that you can definitely improve on. Um, groups at uh, the Media Lab have used uh, PACE, which is a phage-assisted evolution property. So you can do that to engineer better proteins. Uh, you could also, uh, you know, improve um, the pipeline to get structures of proteins like cryo EM or x-ray crystallography. If you do that much more efficiently, you can use that very easily to engineer better and more efficient proteins. Um, our strategy is always use computation and something like Rosetta, um, like, a gene, like a protein modeling software or using bioinformatics, which is what we use for our CRISPR where you know, is a great way to like actually um, be able to modify and play around with protein sequences before actually uh, doing anything in the lab. And that's something that we're trying to pioneer here in the lab as well. Yeah. How would your approach compare with de novo design of proteins? Yeah, I mean, I think our approach is as similar to that as possible, except we're utilizing existing uh, crystal structures of, for example, peptide or ACE2 bound to um, the spike protein of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we're using that to, as a starting point to design our peptides from, right? We're truncating those proteins, that ACE2, to find what is still stable, a stable binder. Um, and so this is a little different than like creating proteins from scratch, where you would create new sequences and see what happens. But that's good for us, because we know that if a protein already works, all we're trying to do is keep it working and then improve on it. And so our pro approach is a little more um, rational, I would say, than a completely de novo design of proteins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, one other question that I have for you is uh, we're planning on developing some more workshops for the biomaker space. 
Yeah. Uh, we'd love to add uh, CRISPR into our repertoire. Yeah. So, you know, can, we, I, can I bug you about that? And, yeah, uh, great. That's a great bug. You know, we do, uh, for the CRISPR class over IAP, we actually have a lab section here in the lab. Um, and it would be wonderful to port that over because I'm going to go to HMS, but I'd love to port that over to a space that is much more well equipped for uh, these kinds of like web like tutorials and workshops. Um, so maybe I'll uh, bring those experiments, those very simple CRISPR experiments that people can do hands on uh, to the biomaker space if you're interested in that. Yeah, I think that sounds great. Love yeah. to talk more offline about that. Yeah, for sure. We shall definitely do that. All right. Well, we are uh, just about at the end of the time, and it looks like uh, we have gone through all the questions. So, uh, I'd like to uh, like to thank you on behalf of everybody in attendance today for uh, for um, bringing us the talk on the exciting work. It was uh, it was very informative and um, very cool stuff going on. Thank you so much, and thanks for everyone for uh, listening and providing their feedback. I appreciate the the, the opportunity to speak. Great. And, uh, and just in closing, I'd like to thank all the participants for attending and uh, stay tuned for the upcoming weeks. Uh, Dr. Gifford's talk next week and uh, Dr. Boyle uh, week following. So look forward to seeing you at future sessions. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye.